Do you get nervous? In, in terms of like, I, I think there's this presumption that when someone is on t TV that they're confident in all situations. So for example, when you walk out here in front of 2,000 people, how do you feel in that situation compared to how you feel when you're about to you know, try and get the most out of a Nazi? But f <laughs> for me, getting the most out of a Nazi, uh, no, let's leave that there. Yeah. I think for me, it's a, it, it, no, I don't really get nervous, although I, uh, on the day when we're, especially if we're starting a project and you're thinking, like, is it going to work out? Mm -hmm. and, and, or is this contributor going to, you know, will we click? Um, th th there's a sort of sense of, well, you know, just a very mild sort of apprehension or, or sort of heightened feeling. But um, it's a very, you know, the, the more, the, the, very often the best material, and, and when you know a documentary is going well, is when you, you just have no sense of occasion. Uh -huh. You know, you're just sort of slipping into the reality of what they're going through. You know, I have to remind myself sometimes that for the contributors, it's quite a big deal. Yeah. Because you can sort of forget that. I think I'd be more nervous if I was coming to film me. Do you know, does that make any kind of sense? If <laughs> someone, mode. If someone was coming to film me and I had to answer the door and go like, hi, come on in, uh, I want to tell you about my life. I think I would feel right. more nervous. Yeah, I you my, I just my role feels very natural. I just arrive and kind of go with the flow. Um, can we watch a bit of By Reason of Insanity? Sure. Um, seeing you back in action. And it's really upsetting to watch mm. when you see a contributor who is unravelling in that way or saying these things on camera when you know that this isn't that they're going to be exposed to the world, their life is probably going to change after you've been on this. And when you're seeing someone speak that way, like what's going on inside of you from, on a journalism level and also on a personal level? Well, I met two or three Jesus Christs. Mm -hmm. And I met a Barack Obama. And I met a guy who was doing deep cover work for the CIA, all um, at that hospital. Mm -hmm. So you sort of... Um, and the, and the mistake I made when I met the Barack Obama, I don't know why, he caught me off guard. And I, and I, and I just said, no, you're not. You know, I don't know why. I, if I'd had any sense, and normally I would have had the sense to say, like, okay, and then change the subject. Mm -hmm. Because the idea is you don't, con you don't directly confront the, um, the delusion. You, you just sort of redirect. But I said, no, you're not. And he, he said, like, he, he said, sort of, mother, fuck you. And, and, and he just got really upset and then and, 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 and wandered off. The, you know, the reality of mental illness is, is, uh, can be very sad. And, um, and, uh, and at the same time, there's that, that, there's that very kind of queasy, sort of surreal quality to it. And I think, um, I think it's, you know, in terms of making programs, it presents a real challenge because you have to, you have to, you have to weigh up the ability to kind of give consent, to have capacity to take part, um, against uh, the fact that actually you don't want to be sort of ableist. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? You don't want to say like, well, because you've got a history of mental illness, sorry, you can't ever be on TV. So it presents all sorts of challenges. But uh, what I do think is that um, it has the, if you make a program in the right way, it has the ability to be very affirmative, very sort of connecting, and, and that, that some of the loneliness that sometimes surrounds mental illness or the sense of stigma and the inability to talk openly about it can be alleviated. And also, there's, I feel like TV's changed a lot in the way that we approach it. There would have been a time when we would, auto, like, we would be set up to laugh at it. Mm. And there's just so much more sensitivity towards it now. Like, you know, what she's saying is it could be seen as funny, but actually it's devastating at the same time. And I guess if you were still doing your old style of your kind of side entrances, mm. it wouldn't work in that scenario. I'm going to take another question. I tried a couple of side entrances for that <laughs> scene, and we cut them out. Right, Toby's just said in my ear that he starred one, but I don't see it. There you go, I just broke the fourth wall. Wasn't that fascinating? Toby, can you just tell me the question, please? I don't see it. Who's Toby? Toby. <laughs> oh, I see it. Toby's in my ear. He's quite flirty, so it's a bit awkward. Um, in the era of fake... Thank you, Toby. Um, in... <laughs> I've never used one of these before, can you tell? Um, in the era of fake news, where does your brand of journalism fit in and how are you going to attempt to combat the public's distrust of journalism? So okay. Down to you, so I think, um, I think in the era, you know, it, well, it's really interesting how the term fake news has been weaponized. As I recall, it started out as a term that was used about 
sort of news stories that were c completely fictional or con constructed sometimes in Eastern Europe and places where some guy who's just trying to generate clicks would make would find a photo and make up a story mm -hmm. that would go go with it like Hillary Clinton eats fetuses for lunch do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and they'd find a picture of like someone taking boxes off a lorry and 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 it would be like okay and then that would get clicked on Facebook and and then Trump then adopted it and began using fake news as a term against the mainstream media I think I think what it I think there's a part of it that is it, that means that it makes, it makes outfits like the BBC, where there are protocols, standards and practices, there is a sort of, you know, it's take, the idea of being factual and responsible is taken very seriously. And I think that that's very valuable in this era in which you can get clicks for just making up mm -hmm. a load of crap. Um, that being said, I'm yeah. going to add one little footnote, which is, but I also do see in this whole populist moment, uh, there's a certain part of it that I do like. Like, mm -hmm. in other words, I've always had enough of the sort of cha chaotic, slightly pyromaniac in me that I enjoy m maverick voices and I enjoy dissident voices. So I think there's elements of that. Like, I don't want to enthrone the mainstream as though we must all be more mainstream. You know, so th I think along with the nonsense and the dangerousness and the racism, there's, there's bits of it that are kind of useful and positive. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk some more about what you like. Um, who are you enjoying at the moment? Well, my TV... Professionally. Well, like my... <laughs> Just like on TV. Should we watch a clip? <laughs> no. Shall I answer the question? I do, please. I'm enjoying so many people. Yeah. And my wife is very understanding about it. Yes. We have a, our TV's been hijacked by our three children. Mm-hmm. It's in, and spe specifically the four-year-old, who you know, yes. Walter, and he watches um, a family on YouTube. I don't even know their name. It's called Kid City. Oh. So I watch about an hour and a half of Kid <laughs> City most days, and they just play video games and film themselves doing it. Did you say what am I watching or what am I enjoying? I was kind of wondering, like in in the in the like uh, documentary in the world of what I'm actually watching. Realm, not necessarily I, what when I get my own moments to watch TV, I find myself, Nancy and I will either watch like the latest sort of big budget series like um, most recently Chernobyl, oh, yeah. which was amazing. And st st sort of the, the big glossy, sometimes the big glossy um, sort of uh, series, mini series. But then, uh, then for my own purposes, if I can get away with it, I, I'll be watching a really good documentary like a, um, you know, The Jinx is one yeah. I always mention, or Making a Murderer, or more recent, or on, on the UK scene, there's so many brilliant documentary makers, and I think um, Sean McAllister is one, Ollie Lambert, um, th there's many, many sort of first person doc makers who aren't always in, Paddy Wivel, who did a recent prison series on Channel 4, who aren't always in vision, but you have a sense of a perspective, and, 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 and it's that, again, it's that sense of being in worlds in which anything can happen, and um, there's a sort of, you just feel like anything could get out of control at any minute.